we're continuing our investigation of this Lamrim glance meditation at the end of the Guru Puja, the Lama Chopa. And uh, as you, if you're familiar with the the stages of the path, um, as was expressed by Atisha and his first, his great text, the Bodhipratapadipam, the lamp of the path to enlightenment that he wrote when he was in Tibet, a great Indian scholar, sort of condensing all of the essential points. Uh, this special flavor of that is that <clears throat> talking about the practices of the three kinds of individuals, a person of initial scope, who has to overcome uh, the attachment to just the appearances of this lifetime, which probably for most of us, maybe that's where we're at. What do you think? Uh, and so the, in the glance meditation that we've been going over, uh, one of the first verse is talking about the, the, uh, the proper way to uh, rely upon a spiritual guide. And then the next two verses are talking about essentially the meditations of the person of initial scope uh, up to and including the suffering of the low, recognizing the suffering of the lower realms. And as a result of that, taking refuge. It doesn't mean that that's the only time you take refuge. And the only way that you take refuge is out of fear of the lower realms, <clears throat> but that's the first way as a beginner, um, worrying about taking rebirth in the next lifetime in the lower realms and therefore taking, recognizing that the way to avoid that is to take refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the Buddha who taught the path, or we can talk about the resultant Buddhahood that we will eventually attain taking refuge in that, and the actual refuge is the, the dharma, which means the truth of cessation and the truth of the path that leads to cessation. I mean, there are many different kinds of dharma, right? Dharma, dharma practices, but the, the uh, real meaning, ultimate meaning of dharma is to take refuge in uh, what, what will really protect us from suffering, Dharma is what protects us from suffering. What really protects us from suffering is true cessation. We, we no longer have uh, the activation of certain of the delusions. And uh, the path that leads to that, meditative equipoise on emptiness, in which you no longer, at, at that point, you no longer have active in your mind stream uh, any of the afflictions. So those verses were talking about first guru devotion and then the individual of immediate of intermediate scope of beginning scope. Then the intermediate scope, uh, a couple of verses, although the person of intermediate scope depends on recognizing death and impermanence and taking refuge in the suffering of the lower realms and everything and um, the functioning of karma the special features is to develop a sense of renunciation, not just of this life alone, not just renunciation of the lower realms suffering, but the renunciation of even, even the upper realms wanting to escape from samsara completely. Even if we're born in the upper realms as a human or as a, as a god, it's not real happiness. It's like, it's like we're in a great ocean um, and we will be attacked, even in the upper realms, say in the desire realm, we'll, we'll still be attacked by the suffering of suffering and changeable suffering, you know, all pervasive suffering. And in the successively higher realms, uh, say the changeable suffering in the God realms and in the form and formless realms, the is the suffering of uh, pervasiveness, not being out of samsara, still, still having the imprint of those 
delusions in our mind stream. So there are two verses there also talking about samsara is like a, a great prison. And then talking about the individual of great scope, when we started to, to uh, we, we have the meditations on developing bodhicitta that's, that distinguishes the individual of great scope from the, inter, the individual of intermediate scope. Although they're, they're said to be practice in common, we still practice, even as a aspiring bodhisattva, we still pr have to activate and achieve the meditations on renunciation of this lifetime and renunciation of all of samsara. Because without recognizing, without achieving those understandings ourselves, we can't really have compassion for others. How could we have compassion for the rich and the famous, the powerful, if we don't recognize those states as actually being in the nature of suffering? And we talked about, um, first of all, developing up to spontaneous, unconstructed, un, un, non-artificial um, compassion through the method of the seven, seven points of cause and effect, which is the verse that says, Nyam dak droa dikun dagima, all of these, recognizing how all of these Pitiful mothers, pitiful migrators have been my mother and treated me in kindness again and again, you know, uh, to develop this natural kind of compassion that doesn't have to have to be, you don't have to use a lot of effort to generate it. Uh, just looking at them, feeling that, that compassion for them. Then building on that, the next verse uh, talking about the uh, equality of self and others, integrating that in, that we all are equal, all sentient beings are equal in wanting to be free of suffering, not liking suffering, not desiring <laughs> suffering, and wanting happiness. Yet, in, in, in that verse, mentioning a, a more deep sense of that, never being satisfied with the happiness that we have. Yeah, there you go, verse 90, developing equanimity between myself and others. Then we, uh, it, and as a result of that in the commentary of Uttu Dharma Bhadra mentioning that this is talking about uh, I guess you, you want to be able to see the last line there, if you can tweak it up a little bit. There you go. Realizing this, I seek your blessings to generate joy in the happiness of others. So as I mentioned in Mudra Dhammabhadra's commentary, he mentions that this is talking about great love. Uh, not just rejoicing in, in the sense of the seven limb rejoicing, which is rejoicing the virtues of others, but rejoicing particularly in the happiness of others. So we went over that. Then we talked about the, uh, in the sequence to develop bodhicitta through uh, this more sophisticated method of equalizing self and others. The next step is to see, to see the faults of self-cherishing. And we talked about this uh, recognizing self-cherishing as like a chronic disease that we have had since beginningless time. And that's, you know, al although it, it's not exactly the same as self-grasping, self-cherishing is kind of the imprint of self-grasping. Self-grasping is the sense of there's really an ego identity, a real I, inherently existent. And as an imprint of that, uh, and the desire to uh, find happiness oneself. What? what <laughs> okay. Uh, one develops a, a sense of 
holding oneself as dear is most important. It's slightly different than the self-grasping. So the self-cherishing, this verse talks about both, but first of all, recognizing that the self-cherishing thought is the, the thought that initially is what's the direct cause of our creating the delusions, creating, creating negative karma as a result of, of uh, the delusions, in the belief in a self I, and then cherishing that. So we, we talked about the last line, uh, grant us blessings to destroy the, the great demon of self-grasping. Here it says selfishness, the demon of, of selfishness. Then, so that's one side, talking about the disadvantages of self-cherishing. And you can think about the, everything that happens to you, every negative thing that happens to you to think how this is a result of negative karma that was, when it was caused, it was created by our self-cherishing attitude that allowed us to give rise to the delusions that created that negative karma. So that's one side. Now the, the other side is to recognize the great kindness of others, the advantages of cherishing others. And uh, verse 92 there, if you could scroll up a little bit. There you go. Uh, the, the attitude, the low, at the end of that sentence, manam chesun de la gobe lo. You could say mind or attitude that uh, cherishes mothers, that is, recognizes sentient beings' kindness and with the exemplar of recognizing them as mother and would set them in bliss. That kind of attitude is the doorway through which infinite qualities arise. Having seen that, understood that, when it says seeing that, it doesn't mean necessarily seeing with your eye, but another way of saying having realized that, uh, even if sentient beings were to rise up as our enemy, you know, appear as enemies, uh, to still cherish them more than even our, that we cherish our own life. So the, the great example of that is to read the, the Jataka tales, the life stories of the Buddha, when he was a Bodhisattva on the path. And uh, again and again, giving up, you know, always with that, that thought of cherishing others and wishing to set them in bliss with the intention still in his mind, and, and perhaps in some of those cases, he already had bodhicitta, but recognizing that, he, that we can, with that goal in mind of developing infinite qualities from which we can, we can help sentient beings, the way to do that is to cherish them, cherish them even more than our own lifetime. So we talked about that. Then we talked about, if you move it up a little, there you go. Dorna, Chipa Rangdong, Gonadang, Tubong Shendong Bashik Sebayi, Kyondan Yondin Yo, Topelo, Dakshin, Yamje Nupa Jingilo. So this is talking about the, in brief, then bringing these two concepts of defects of self-cherishing, the advantages of cherishing cherishing others, bringing them together. Uh, there's no need to say a lot, as Shanti Deva says in the Bodhisattva Charyavatara. Stupid beings like ourselves, infantile, uh, childish beings, work only for their, our own benefit. Rangdun. When we talk about uh, the two goals, Rangdun and Shendong. Rangdun means our own aims, our own goal. Uh, but ordinary beings work for their own goal in the sense of just the happiness of this lifetime, whereas the Munindra, the Buddha, the Tubuang, they work only for the welfare of others, solely for the welfare of others. Yet they achieve their own ultimate goal of the Dharmakaya. When we talk about, when we talk in the Mahayana, we talk about achieving one's own goal, ultimate goal is the achievement of the omniscient mind. And of course, the emptiness of that, which is called the Svavavikakaya, the, the nature body. 
and achieving the ultimate welfare of others, which is the ability to emanate uh, the Sambhogakaya or the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body, the Nirmanakaya or the Sambhogakaya, the, the enjoyment body, which is emanated for the sake of teaching the Arya Bodhisattvas. So there's no need to say a lot. In short, you know, infantile beings, childish beings work only for their own ends, whereas the, the Buddhas, the great beings, the noble beings, noble beyond Arya noble, but in the sense of, you know, the really highest thing is to work only for the welfare of others. So weighing in one's mind the defects of working for oneself and the advantages of working for others, we ask for blessings for the ability to equalize ourselves and others and to exchange, equalize and exchange ourselves with others. Dag Shen Nyam Je Nupa Jingilok. And we talked about of the, the decisions uh, that one can make in these various verses. This is to, to, to recognize that we are capable, we are able. In that last line, Dag Shen Nyam Je Nupa, Nupa means uh, grant us blessings to be able to do that. Then the next verse, Rangi Chesen Guba Gungi Go, Manam Chesen Yundin Kugishi, Deche Dakshin Jewe Neldrala, Nyamnan Ningbor Jingo Jingi Lok. We talked about. So this is now making that decision to take the, the practice of exchanging self and others as our heart essential practice. So not many people I know of do this. Maybe some lamas do. Do you do? I know this is very difficult. The, the, that means the, the major thing at this point in your development of bodhicitta is to put emphasis on exchanging self and others. That doesn't mean you become the others. The others become you, as we mentioned. But to recognize to always put yourself in the in the uh, shoes of the other person. Is that an expression you use in Singapore? Putting your, your, yourself in their situation, looking back at yourself, criticizing your own tendency, say in my case, George, tendency to think of myself first uh, and to think of it from the side of the other person, to work for, for their welfare. So to cherish their happiness, their gain, their notoriety, you know, to, to take an importance of their poverty, to try to eliminate their poverty and so forth. So I seek your blessings to, it doesn't say enable, in your text there it says, I seek your blessings to enable me to equalize and exchange myself and others. As I mentioned, I thought you had the correct, yeah, yeah, there it is. Hence, I seek your blessings to make my heart practice the yoga of exchanging myself and others. Last time you had a text that had that correct translation in it. And I mentioned that this is, this is how I had in the, uh, in the retreat handbook, this incorrect translation that doesn't say enable me in this, in this verse. Then we talked also about the next line, the next verse, which is a famous verse with five lines, which is now the first practice of, of utilizing this in some kind of yogic practice of tong len, giving and taking, giving our body, our possessions, and even our merits of the three times transformed into things that could be used by sentient beings. So we talked about, uh, I seek your blessings that all the negativities, obscurations, and suffering of all mother migrators may, without exception, each and every one of them ripen on me right now. So would imagine in those kind of meditations, beginning even by, taking your own suffering, first of all, your own future suffering of the next hour or the next day or the next, the rest of this life or future lives. Imagine taking that now as a practice, but then 
taking on the sufferings of those who are close to you, those who are strangers, even eventually enemies, all sentient beings of all times. Imagining what that's like, the, the you know, developing uh, out of compassion, taking that suffering on and, and putting it on the self-cherishing thought with a wisdom consciousness that recognizes that that, is, that has a great benefit, that that conscious, with, with your own volition, taking that suffering on can help to erode the self-cherishing thought. That that's what can cause it to diminish. And then to send out from your, your, uh, your mind all your good qualities once people have been sentient beings, all your mothers, your previous mothers have, uh, their sufferings have been alleviated to send out all of the good qualities that can, can benefit them. Yeah, so we talked about that. Then the next verse we talked about also, the uh, how did how through thought to transfer to transform adverse conditions in the path, like Lama Tsongkhapa said, in this degenerate age, one of the important practices was the practice of uh, the in tantra of the practice of yamataka, because uh, there are so many adverse conditions. Uh, without some kind of special wrathful practice like that, it was very difficult to be able to be successful in one's tantric practice. Here on the sutra part, we talk about transforming adverse conditions of the path through thought and through action. This verse is and the, how to transform them through thought when your environment, your own personal environment, your own ne, and your own chew, your own, your own being, are filled with the results of uh, the past negative karma. And undesired suffering falls like rain. Almost seems like that right now in the United States with these, uh, the uh, the rhetoric of the of the, of the uh, conservatives and the liberals and fighting and and everything. Almost seems like there's, you know. To take to imagine taking all that on yourself and recognizing your own, you know, your own suffering, recognizing that by experiencing this with a compassionate mind, with a patient mind, you will exhaust those negative negative karmas that are ripening so that they won't ripen in the future. But also imagining through the Tong Len that you're experiencing of these sufferings right now, this chaos. You know, you know, anger and so forth, that you, by you imagining, you're experiencing it for others through Tong Len, that that will exhaust the collective karma that we have together to experience these unbearable situations. Then we talked about the next verse. Again, there's a Dorna at the beginning. In short, Whatever arises, whatever appearances arise, whether they be good or bad, uh, through the practice of the uh, heart of all Dharma practices, the five forces, Tobna. So, what were those? The force of intention, or Tenpe uh, the force of, you know thrusting forward. So with a, at the beginning of any, any kind of practice. Like when we do at the beginning of all of our sadhanas and everything, we always try to have a great, a, a, a proper motivation at the beginning. That's an example of this uh, force, this first force. Then the force of the white seed. The power of the white seed means uh, the, in this, in this context, talks about the creation of virtuous karma. Uh, so in order to make realizations, we have to accumulate virtuous karma, which we're probably deficient in. 
And the third force is the force of Sunjin uh, Gitop, which I, I keep on always forgetting the, the English translation that I like, uh, repudiation, the force of repudiating the self-cherishing thought and the self-grasping. So that also includes purifying negative karma. If we think about the five of the five forces, so at the beginning of any practice to have a, a good motivation, the pempeto, the, the force of intention, then the force of the white seed and the force of uh, repudiation in a certain context means generating virtuous actions and, and purifying negative karma. Then the force of familiarity can come anywhere in there. So all of these practices we familiarize, we meditate, we try to have less and less distraction in practicing them. And finally, the, the, the force of prayer. Those are called the, the five forces. So what was that? The force of intention, force of white seed, the force of repudiation, the force of familiarity, the force of, of prayer. So that can mean, in our usual sadhana, that might mean the, the dedication prayer at the end, dedicating the merits. It can also mean, as when Lama Tsongkhapa had a vision of Manjushri, and he asked, well, I think his, his uh, Dharma friend, the, uh, the uh, I think he was a Nyingma practitioner who had a, had a, had a vision of Manjushri before Lama Tsongkhapa had a vision. I'm not sure at what point this was, whether this was a point when Lama Zob Lama Tsongkhapa still depended on his, uh, his friend who had a direct vision of Manjushri. Later, Man Lama Tsongkhapa had the direct vision himself at what point. But anyway, he asked Manjushri, either through this other person or his, his direct vision, what was the quickest way to make realizations? And Manjushri said you had to eliminate negative karma, create virtuous karma, accumulate the accumulations, collect the accumulations of, of uh, virtue, and pray to the guru as oneness with the deity. And of course he said, and to meditate. So it, it, essentially you have four of those. Meditate means to familiarize. So you have essentially those, those same five forces we really need in any kind of practices that's going to bring about anything, any kind of meditative achievement. So whatever, whatever arises, whether it be good or bad, may we be able to uh, meditate on it, uh, use it as a path to enhance the two bodhicittas, the conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta, through the, through the practice of these five forces. So familiarizing oneself again and again with conventional bodhicitta, you know, when things go wrong, uh, you, out of empathy for others, using that to enhance one's conventional bodhicitta. Oh, this is a chance for me to purify my negative karma and to develop my compassion for others who are experiencing the same kind of thing. And when things, uh, you know, at other times when one tries to meditate on the ultimate bodhicitta, the emptiness of all phenomena. So when one of the, there, there may be times in your practice when you put more emphasis on developing conventional bodhicitta, maybe even for a long, long period of time, and the, the meditation on emptiness is a little bit, is there, but not, not the emphasis. At other times when you're, you don't make any progress in the conventional bodhicitta, you put more emphasis on the ultimate bodhicitta, the meditation on emptiness. Even on the meditation on conventional bodhicitta, like the Dalai Lama says, like a sword that has two edges. Sometimes you use, you're mainly trying to emphasize the seven aspects of cause and effect. And when that gets a little bit dull, you know, you're not making a lot of progress, switch over to the other edge of the sword of uh, equalizing ex and exchanging oneself and others, that method. Of course, this method we're talking about here utilizes the two together. So whatever comes up, whether it be good or bad, 
When good things happen, recognizing it as the result of your past virtuous karma ripening and uh, recognizing that if you'd like to have these good things to happen again in the future, you have to create virtuous karma. And as a result of this, to meditate, to ide bashe gomba jingheo, to familiarize only exclusively with a with a happy mind, to be, as I, as I mentioned, Kirti Sanchar Rinpoche, who was a teacher of Lama Zopa and our, ourselves, that was, Lama Zopa would emphasize again and again how Kirti Sanchar Rinpoche always had this, you know, always was happy, always, whatever happened outside, you know, it's just like, uh, it's not, it's not, not like an idiot who is, you know, sort of always giggling and, and uh, maybe drooling or something, even when bad things are happening. This is a wisdom happiness that through the, the practice of the, of the Dharma, especially the Buddhachitta exchanging oneself and others, has, this is a, a, a defining characteristic, a measure of having trained the mind. So in Mutra Dharma Bhadra's commentary, for this verse, he says, Sechik nyam lendang lo jungitse. So the, the practice of one life, which is the, which is the, the way that we, we try to meditate whatever occurs uh, to enhance the two bodhicittas, and the measure of, of having trained the mind, one of the measures is to always have a happy mind. As I, measure, as I mentioned, uh, this one friend of Lama Yeshe's who was, uh, you know, went through the, the programs, the studies together with Lama Yeshe and went off to be a yogi in, in Dharamsala. Uh, when they were talking about their life practice near the end of their lives, uh, they mentioned, Lama Yeshe mentioned how they had, you know, they had achieved this uh, ability to exchange one, the happiness of others, you know, exchange self and others to work for the happiness of others. And uh, this Lama, who was the friend of Lama Yeshis, he had uh, had the situation at the, in Patankat at the train station I mentioned to you before, where he had uh, he had been beaten by the police, imprisoned, and so forth, and all during this time until he was released, when they recognized he was not the person that they were they were seeking. Uh, when he measured, when he mentioned this to the Dalai Lama, he said he was he had all during the time he only had a happy mind. There was never a, an instant of being unhappy. So this is a measure of having trained the mind. One of the other measures, as is probably Venerable Sanghi Kanu has mentioned, is things like. Never, you know, being able to practice even when the mind is distraction, distracted by other things. Sort of almost the same thing. And we talked also last time, the next verse is the, now is the, uh, how to put, uh, how to transform adverse conditions into the path through activity. Jorwe Kenyan Lamdu Jorsu Dang Damsik Labja. So this is this has two two of the points of the of the mind training, and it also uh, the four activities, meaning uh, when things are going wrong, to recognize that it is uh, one of the the faults is that you don't have enough karma. So to to uh, one of the activities is to create virtuous karma again and again. So as I mentioned, Atisha, when he went, whenever he traveled, he would see a beautiful landscape and so forth. He would offer it to the Buddhas, offer it to the gurus. Lama Yeshe used to say, when you get your groceries, you bring it back from the grocery store, put it first in your altar or on a table in front of your altar and offer it to the Buddhas. You might think, you might be dubious. You think, oh, that's not, you know, you have to relinquish things that you offer to the Buddha, right? There was a there was one of the Geshe's in uh, New Zealand. Uh, 
I think it was the Dorji Chang Institute in Auckland. Uh, when I went, I visited there during the pujas, you couldn't if the, you all the offerings you had to open them up, and uh, you couldn't you, you couldn't save them, you know. If you you had to you had to you offered them so like they were offered and you couldn't take them back. You couldn't utilize them. Lama Yeshi used to say, "No, no, not like that. You can." Just like the things that are owned by yourself, by owned by others, you can offer to the Buddha, and the Buddha can, the Buddha's omniscient mind can experience those. So when you get groceries, you can put them on the altar, offer to the Buddhas, and then the Buddhas don't mind. You can have, you can eat them afterwards. <laughs> this is interesting. You have to think about that one. So, uh, so collect virtuous karma, and then. One of the other activities is to purify negativities, to offer tormas to the obstructing spirits. As a beginner, we could offer them, ask them not to harm. And as a higher practitioner, we can ask them to help us develop bodhicitta through even bringing suffering upon us. Same thing with the protectors of the Dharma. So there's mundane spirits and uh, the super mundane protectors. And then the last part of it is the uh, to make this life meaningful by observing the uh, samayas and pledges of the, the lojong. And uh, I'm not sure, I never got a clear answer if, the, if you had a chance to download that little document I sent that had the, the uh, commitments of the mind training on it. Eighteen, eighteen commitments and the twenty-two precepts, or all over the translation. Okay. I hope you can get if you if you don't have that. That's from the the uh, translation of the liberation of the palm of your hand that was done by Geshe Tarchin student Art Engel. Okay. So then the next verse. Tonglen lung la kyonpe tu tek chen, jam dang ning jay lakpe sabaye, jonam si so jay le dro e chir, jang shun sem ni jong bajeng. Again, we, we mentioned last time. The, uh, now the first instance of uh, utilizing tonglen on the breathing. Almost, you know, maybe preparing for relationship with the, the lung sem, the, the wind and mind in Tantra, because there are many kinds of practices where we also try to utilize the breathing uh, in term and the mind. In, in Tantra, we talk about three things, right? The, the mind, its mounting wind. Well, even in Sutra, we talk about it. We, we utilize that understanding from Tantra that the mind is like a rider on a horse. The horse is like the wind, the mind is like the rider, inseparable. And the pathway through which those mounting winds travel within our body are the nadis. So those three things, the nadis, the winds, and the minds, and the bindus that flow within those that, that, that cause the bliss are the special features of Tantra. Here we're just talking about mounting the mind of Tonglen on the breathing through that magical device and through what you give, giving with love, jam, and when you, when you take on the suffering of others, you do it out of compassion, Mingje, and as a result of that, recognizing that you have not really changed the outer situation, you've strengthened the mind, and to, to develop the exceptional thought, Lakbe Samba, or as the Dalai Lama sometimes translates, universal responsibility that I myself must bring about. I myself must achieve enlightenment in order to uh, 
actually help sentient beings to take on their suffering, to alleviate their suffering, to, to bring happiness. Only the Buddhists can do that. And as a result of that, to develop actual bodhicitta, jangshub semni jongba jengilo. So that was more or less where we got last time. So I wanted to mention something from the Mutra Dhamma Bhadra's text. When you first, he says, when you first have this thought, the wish that thinks, if I were to achieve enlightenment, complete enlightenment, how wonderful that would be. This is kind of, this is kind of wishing bodhicitta, right? This is called mongsem samboa. Mongsem, mongsem means wishing bodhicitta or aspirational bodhicitta, the, the aspirational mind. Samboa means the mere one. It just, it's, it's not like saying, it's not like making a promise, I will do that. This is called Mon Sem Samboa. And uh, here in this text, it says Jangchub Sem Ni. That's, that's the further one that thinks that actually uh, having familiarized oneself with, uh, wow, wouldn't it be great if I achieved enlightenment? Actually making a promise, a Damchen, Damcha, Damcha Chen that thinks, uh, I will hold on to this without giving it up, the thought of achieving enlightenment. That is called the Senipa, uh, the fully qualified aspirational mind. So this, this verse is just talking about, uh, when we talk about, what does it say here, to train only in bodhicitta, that's not the, generally that's not the meaning that most of the commentaries say, the, the ni, when it says jangshub sem ni, it means senipa, that means fully qualified bodhicitta. And it, here it's talking about the wishing bodhicitta. So through that tonglen to develop a fully qualified bodhicitta in sequence, first having, you know, taking on the suffering, sending out your happiness, recognizing none of that has really changed, that I, I myself must achieve, and uh, you know, I much, I myself will take this responsibility to do that. That's the uh, exceptional thought, the universal responsibility. That's my responsibility. Like the 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 beginning of the eight verses of training the mind that we taught some time a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. The very first verse, I, I'd like to translate it with responsibility, taking the responsibility to achieve the highest benefit for all sentient beings I will hold the most dear. There it didn't say in the actual Tibetan verse, it didn't say lakbe sam, it didn't say exceptional thought, it just said sampayi, with a thought, with a, with a you know, resolution, resolve to, to bring about the greatest benefit for sentient beings. So then the next verse, Dusum Gyawa Kungi Trochik Lam, Namdak Gyalse Dombai Gyutam Shing, Tekchok Sultim Sungi Nyamlen La, Sompa Lulan Cheba Jingilo. So Dusum Gyawa means the, the three time vict conquerors, the, the, the Buddhas of the past, present, and the future. Gyawa means uh, conqueror or victors, Kungi Drocheklam, the one path that all of them have traveled to achieve that. Somewhere along, of course, they had to <laughs> they had to develop many things on that path, right? But the, seg the segment of the path that they, they've all had the path. You can't you can't get to enlightenment with going over without going over this segment of the path that is taking and keeping the pure vows of the sons of the victors, the, or the offspring of the victors, the Gelsay. So uh, the center in Washington, D.C. asked me in a couple of weeks to teach the 37 practices of the Gelsay. That means the 
Sometimes it says the, the 37 practices of the Bodhisattvas, some translations, sometimes they say uh, the sons of the Buddhas. Actually, Jina Putra, just like the, we say Rajaputra, Rajput means prince, right? The son of the Raja. Raja Putra means son. You can say offspring if you want to, uh, to be gender inclusive. So the, 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 the princes and princesses are, were the, uh, the Jina, uh, the uh, Raja Putra. In the, in the Buddhist sense, we, call, we talk about the Jina Putra, the, son, the sons and daughters of the conquerors. So that's an, that's an epithet, a name for the Bodhisattvas. It's not the word Bodhisattva, it's another word, Jina Putra. So the so the, the one path uh, that's traveled by all of the conquerors, the jinas of the three times, is to bind their continuum with the vows of the, the pure vows of the bodhisattvas, the gelse, the jina putras. Okay? Tekchok sultim sumgi nyamlenla, Sumpa Lulan Chepa Jingilo, grant me blessings to uh, practice with great effort, uh, to, to put effort into the practice, the nyamlen of the three Mahayana moralities, three Mahayana ethics. Techchok Sultim Sumgi. So you know that from other contexts. I mentioned it last time. Uh, that means the, the morality of abstaining from negativities, the morality of collecting virtuous dharmas, which has, is very, in, very large, very inclusive. That means uh, not only creating virtuous karma, but developing the good qualities, clairvoyance, understanding of emptiness, how, to, how, to pra how the bodhisattvas practice, how the hearers practice, how, the, uh, how do the pratikavodas practice. All of these things are collecting virtuous dharmas, and then the, the uh, ethics or the morality of benefiting sentient beings with bodhicitta. So in the Bodhipratabhadipam, Atisha mentioned the different ways of doing that. I can't remember, I think there were you enumerated 11 different um, things that he talked about. There are numberless ways to benefit sentient beings, but but, uh, you know, when people are in the hospital, there's sometimes the Sangha go at ABC. I know that's wherever the resident Sangha would, would go to the hospital and other people would go to the hospital to, to be with them, to help sentient beings in various ways. There are various ways to, to benefit sentient beings. So essentially, those, all of the Bodhisattva vows, all of the enumerations of the Bodhisattva vows, can be en encompassed, you can divide them up into these various things. Certain of the vows are the, the morality of abstaining from negative actions, especially those that the bodhisattvas, their special practices. Some of them are to accumulate virtuous uh, dharmas. Some of them are to, to particularly to benefit sentient beings. If you ever have a chance to, uh, if, if some lama comes or if Gen Rinpoche when, when Ken Rinpoche comes back, Geshe Chuni, uh, and there's a situation when you'd like to, he, he asks, or a teacher, visiting teacher asks if there's any teaching you'd like to have. Rather than having the same teachings again and again, everyone wants to have Gyu Lama or, you know, Uttara Tantra, so all these certain teachings you always have again and again, to ask for a com the Lama Son Kappa's commentary on the, uh, the Bodhisattva, uh, the, the, mor the morality chapter from Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary uh, on the vows, so the, about, about the Bodhicitta vows. So incredible detail. And you can see explicitly how all of the, the Bodhisattva vows, how they arose from different sutras and how in the Tibetan tradition they were enumerated in certain ways and how to keep them perfectly and so forth. It's incredible 
if you ever had an opportunity to receive teachings on that, that would be very good. There was one American uh, from a very famous family, the Mellon family in America, who, who translated that morality chapter. I think it's from the Bodhisattva Bhumi, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary to the morality chapter of the Bodhisattva Bhumi. Uh, and fortunately, it was so expensive <laughs> when it was printed. It was like, even if you go to Amazon or something, it costs like $200 or something for this one volume, but you may be able to find it printed some other place or from the library. So this verse is now talking about engaging bodhicitta, right? The, the, the previous verse was talking about developing uh, the wishing bodhicitta. So this is the way, this is, uh, the Mutra Dharma Bhajra's commentary says, uh, the way to take the engaging vows. So it's, so this is talking about the, uh, and, and it doesn't, it, here, although some, sometimes when, when the Dalai Lama and other people give this commentary to this verse, they tell about the ceremony that you can take, but it, it, you don't, you can, certainly that can be explained here, but this can be, just mean what you have to do is to, to generate engaging bodhicitta, you have to take the bodhisattva vow that I will actually engage in the activities of the bodhisattva. And all of the, of the, the six perfections are included in this. So that you take a vow to engage in the bodhisattva's activity. So what are your responsibilities then? You have to practice the six perfections in everyday life. And uh, although there's called a practice of the six perfections, you don't actually, actually only the omniscient mind has the actual six perfections. We talk about the special practice of the six perfections on the higher bhumis. The first bhumi, when you, once you've realized emptiness directly, on the first bhumi, you have an exceptional practice of ethics, and on the second, of, of generosity, sorry. And the second bhumi, uh, a, a special practice of the perfection of ethics, morality. And the third bhumi, patience. Fourth bhumi, uh, enthusiastic perseverance. Fifth bhumi, concentration. Sixth bhumi, wisdom, and then even further beyond that, uh, prayer and so forth. So I seek your blessings that I may eagerly endeavor, well, yeah, in, eagerly, I'm not sure, Lurlin uh, means to, in, you know, intensively practice uh, the vows, the practice of the three Mahayana moralities. So this means taking the vows of the, of the Bodhisattva. So introducing again, the next one is the first of the six perfections, the perfection of generosity. Okay. Ludang wang cho du sum ge sok che, sem chen rang rang do bing mo gyur te, chak me tong sen pe wei mena ki jin pe bar jin zo bar jin So when you are practicing generosity, uh, you can, you know, you can pray, you begin to practice generosity, the three kinds of generosity. In the sutra system, we talk about three kinds of generosity, right? Uh, the generosity of material things, sangsin, sangsing. Um, I think I wrote down here somewhere the, the Sanskrit. I always forget. Oh, Amisha, Amisha Dana, Dana. Amisha means like fleshy. So sometimes I think Konza used to translate it as fleshy things or, you know, things of the flesh or, you know, material things. Sangsing, Sangsing means, uh, you know, 
uh, it doesn't say material. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, just like or, uh, that, but the kind of thing that you can put in the begging bowl, Amisha, Dana. So that's one of the things you can give. You can give uh, in the sutra system here, we talk about the charity or generosity of fearlessness. So when, uh, besides, th that's included in giving. Um, besides giving material things to people like food and bedding and uh, clothing and things like this. And of course, when you talk about uh, to the holy beings, you can you know, be giving uh, candles and incense and flowers and so forth. You can give that to ordinary people also. But then you can also give fearlessness when people are in danger to eliminate their fear, uh, to give them, to be a, an advocate for them. To, if, if animals are in fear of losing their life to save them, when a mouse is caught by a cat and the cat is about to devour it, or, oftentimes they play with them first, right? Do you notice that? The, uh, the, the cat has the mouse in its mouth and shaking it and sort of puts it on the floor and waits a while and before it devours it, maybe brings it to you as a gift if, it's a, if it likes you. Dogs do that also, right? So one of the, the, one of the ways of practicing the generosity of, of uh, fearlessness or you know, protection from fear Mijikbe Jimba is to uh, save those beings. Uh, if beings are, uh, if fish like uh, uh, Venerable Damcho used to be called, what was it, Colonel Fred, Major Fred, used to save, maybe still does, save fish and uh, animals. That's an example of the generosity of, of fearlessness. Uh, Lama Zopa sometimes saves larger animals uh, that are about to be slaughtered, buys them and keeps them protected as much as possible. That's an example of the generosity of fearlessness. And then there's the, the generosity of the Dharma. Which means many, actually many things. Generosity of the Dharma includes things like teaching the Dharma, giving the, giving instruction and uh, helping people understand renunciation and bodhicitta and the, the wisdom of emptiness and so forth. But it also in, in this practice of, um, when it, it, in, in this verse it says, I seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the Guideline teaching. I'm not sure what they're translating there. Budan Longjo do some gizu che semchen rong rong dupe no gyurte chakme tongsen pel pen oh pelwe mengaki. Mengak means instruction, special instruction, sort of like the the uh, was it Upadesha, the the instruction that the guru gives how to do this for to do a practice to enhance the mind of giving without attachment. Chakme means without attachment. Tongsem means the mind of giving. What is generosity? What is it? it how do you complete the perfection of generosity? Is it by the perfection of generosity is achieved when only when you have given everything away or when uh, only when there are no longer beggars? Is that, is that the definition of of having achieved the perfection of generosity? No, the, the generosity is defined as the mind of giving. So how, do you, how can you bring that about, the mind of giving, to, to develop that mind that gives without attachment, without holding anything back? How can you develop that? You do it in stages. You begin uh, by giving small things, and you do it even in just in thought, you, you imagine your body, which you eventually will be able to give, all of your possessions, 
and even the virtuous karma that you've created in the past and the present, and even dedicating the, the virtuous karma that you'll create in the future. Those are the three things that you can, you can give from your own, can, your own, that you own, let's say. Transforming them into that which is desired by each and every sentient being, whatever they need. So you imagine that the oral instruction here that can enhance the mind of giving is to imagine your own body transforming into a wish-fulfilling jewel or wish-fulfilling tree. If you're a complete materialist now, <laughs> converting them into trust funds for all sentient beings or into, into money or something like that. Uh, but a wish-fulfilling gem, wish-fulfilling tree are things that exist in, it, uh, in certain eras and pure times to Chakravartin kings and, and other bodhisattvas that have the ability to fulfill whatever wish people want, whether they want companions, whether they want uh, houses, whether they want jobs, whether they want food, you know, sofas, <laughs> beds, cars, whatever people want. Imagine your own uh, body, your own possessions, your own merits of the three times transformed into whatever sentient beings want. So in Mutra Dharma Bhadra's commentary, he mentions that. your own, you know, the material giving. Remember I said there are three kinds of giving. Giving of material, sangsan gijimba or amisha dana means giving material things. This is when you imagine, uh, you know, giving of you know, the, all of your bodies, your possessions and so forth, transforming into whatever people want, whether they be uh, food or clothing or uh, abodes or beds or compan companions, you know, friends and wives and children and so forth. Uh, this is, this is what, when your body and, and merits and, and possessions transform into these. This is called uh, giving of material, sangsangi jimpa. Then when you imagine that the, on the, from your, the wish, your, your body, your possessions, your merits transform into these wish-fulfilling gems or wish-fulfilling trees that send out light rays. You can also do this when you do the tantric sadhanas, when you recite mantra, imagine, light rays coming from your heart and on the end of them are uh, these things that sentient beings want and also uh, to the cure for the hot and cold hells you know the the ends of these rays from the wish fulfilling gems or in the tantric practices when you recite mantra imagining sending out these rays having the ability to bring to to uh, to bring coolness cool breeze to the beings in the hell realms you know to transform their uh, the the molten copper that they are being immersed in by the hell hell protectors being forced down again and again boiling up to the, their flesh is gone and the bones dissolve again and again revived all of these various kinds of things revive Transforming, transforming those environments into like a swimming pool. <laughs> so they have a human body that they're enjoying these things. This is the giving of fearlessness when you imagine separating them from suffering, such as the hot and cold, cold hells, the, uh, the hunger and thirst of the pretas, their frantic, frenetic behavior, the ignorance and, 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 uh, of the animal realm, uh, all of these things, separating them from these kinds of suffering of lower realms. This is called the protection of 
fearlessness. Well, I think you can not just the lower realms, also the, the Asura realm that are so fearful that, you know, they're, they're losing in battle and, and, the, and the devas at certain points are fearful near the end of their life when the signs of, <clears throat> the signs of their deva uh, bodies, you know, they begin to perspire, perspire and their flowers, their garlands fade and so forth. Uh, and their minds become incredibly depressed. Sending out your merits, especially, uh, to them in these ways is, is the giving of fearlessness. And then the giving of the Dharma. Here it says, Rangyugi Gesa Nam Semchen Tamshela Tangwe. So the, the example of giving the Dharma in this context is giving to all sentient beings the roots of one's own virtues, in the, of one's own continuum. But also in, the, in this meditation, imagining sending out emanations that teach the Lan Rim from the beginning, uh, teach them the alphabet, teach them the Lan Rim, teach them the, the tantric practices and so forth. So when it says, Chakme Tonsen Pelwe Mengak Gi, through the oral instruction of, of enhancing the mind of giving without attachment. Those are the kind of procedures you imagine giving your body, transforming it into a wish-fulfilling jewel. Like, like Shantideva says in the Buddhasattva Charivatara, may my body transform into whatever sentient beings need, whether it be sleep, you know, clothing for sleeping, you know, bedding or pajamas or, you know, food or whatever, whatever sentient beings need to satisfy their, uh, to overcome their suffering, to, to make them susceptible to receiving the teachings and actually teachers coming out and, and benefiting them. Ludang Longcho Dusum Geso Che, Semchen Rang Rang Dope Nogyote, transformed into whatever is desired by each and every sentient being. Chakme Tonsen Pelwe Mengaki, through the oral instruction that enhances the mind of giving without attachment, grant me blessings to perfect the, to, to complete the perfection of generosity. So again, generosity is, is, not, is not defined by, uh, they're no longer being beggars. If you've, you know, to complete the perfection of generosity, you can only do that if no one has needs any longer. That's not the meaning. Nor that you give away everything you have, but it's the mind that can give whatever is needed by sentient beings. And the way to enhance that, to increase that slowly, is this kind of oral instruction that's, that's mentioned here. I wish I could see your faces to see if that makes sense. Maybe this is something you already know, you've heard so many times. Okay, so then the next verse is the, the verse on the perfection of morality or Sheila. Sheila has the sense of cooling the, the, in the etymology the Buddha gave in the, in the Prajnaparamita, I think, uh, it, because it, it cools the mind. So the, the word shila, the, the, uh, the Sanskrit word has to do with cooling. So like a cool breeze when you're oppressed with heat. So this begins, Sotar Jangsen Sangak Dombai. Chesang Soki Chiryang Mi Tong Shing. So Tongwa here, Mi Tong means not giving up, not, not just giving, but not giving up uh, the vows of Sotar means Pratimoksha. Uh, Lama Sokapa mentions in some of his commentaries that, and the Dalai Lama mentions also, the usually we think of Sosar Tarpa Prati Moksha as uh, individual liberation vows. 
you know, that you take those vows to achieve your own individual liberation, like the, like the, uh, the vows of the hearers or pratika Buddhas and so forth. The, the, monks vow, the monks' vows and the layperson's vows and so forth. <clears throat> but uh, the actual, Lama Sokapa mentioned that the actual meaning of Pratimoksha is beginning vows. So, so Tarpa doesn't have to be an individual, you know, the vow of your, wanting to achieve a liberation for yourself, but in the sense of the beginning of liberation, taking those vows, the same way that taking the Bodhisattva vows is the beginning of the quest for enlightenment. So Sotar, Jangsem means Bodhisattva, Sangnak means secret mantra, Dompayi, it is the vows of Pradimoksha, Bodhicitta, or Bodhisattva, and secret mantra. Chesang Sogi Chiryang Midosheng, not giving those vows up even for at the sake, not, not, not giving up the Chesang, even the you know, the, the, um, the demarcations of those vows, the, those that are uh, what are called the natural, natural vows, like killing, stealing, that are, that are negative, that you, abs you uh, abstain from uh, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and so forth, which are naturally negative negativities. And even the, those things that, are, that were enjoined by the Buddha through his instruction, not eating after midday, uh, not touching fire, not digging in the ground and so forth for the monks and nuns, not giving up any of the natural or uh, the vows that the Buddha gave as his, his uh, advice, not giving them up even at the sake of one's life, Kechu dudan semchen dunju pe sultim barchen sokpar jingilo. So that's the the first one is talking about the morality of abstaining from negative actions. Remember, we talked about in the previous verse, we talked about the three kinds of Mahayana morality. Now they're explicitly talked about. So the, the morality of abstaining from negativities means not giving up, not not transgressing. Any of the vow, any of the uh, the vows of the pratimoksha, say in the, in the case of many of you lay people, your lay vows, your bodhisattva vows, or your tantric vows, even at the even uh, at the sake of one's life, so keeping those vows. That's the the morality of abstaining from negative actions. Gechu dudang. Gechu dudang means the virtuous dharmas, collecting. Dupa means to collect, accum to, to accumulate. So that means creating virtuous karma, learning the dharma, learning the rituals, and so forth. Studying the dharma, you know, learning how to meditate on emptiness, on bodhicitta. And then Semchen Dundrup, to achieve the welfare of sentient beings. Semchen means sentient beings. Dundrup, Drup means like city. Sid, well, Dundrup means Siddhartha, you know, like the, the name of the, the Buddha when he was born this, his last life, uh, as Shakyamuni. He was called Siddhartha, he who will achieve the aims, all aims. So Dundrup, Tibetan name, sometimes maybe you know someone named Dundrup. Dun means Arta, aim. Drup means Siddha, to achieve. So to achieve the aims of sentient beings, that means the morality of benefiting sentient beings with Bodhicitta. So this is, this, so through that, Sultim Parchin Sokpar Jengilob, grant me blessings to complete the perfection of morality, of Shila, the Shila Paramita, which, which does not give up the Pratimoksha, Bodhisattva, or secret mantra 
vows, all of the chesam, the, 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 uh, all of the demarcations of those vows, even at the sake of their life. That's the morality of abstaining from negative actions. Collecting virtuous dharmas, morality, and the, the morality of benefiting sentient beings, achieving the, the aims of sentient beings, as it's said here. This is how one practices the perfection of morality, how to cut one complete sense. So there's so many details of the perfection of giving and the perfection of ethics, of morality. This is just talking in general. So, so when, you, when you get to those verses, you might go to the Lanrim Chemo or to some teaching on the six perfections and study, again, all of the details of giving. When you, when you are practicing the perfection of giving and, and when you're practicing any of the perfections, you want to practice any of the perfection, any of the six perfections with all six perfections. So what that means is there is a way to practice uh, the generosity of generosity, the ethics of generosity, the patience of generosity, the enthusiastic first, uh, enthusiastic perseverance of generosity, the concentration, concentration of generosity, and the wisdom of generosity. So let's take the, the last one, one of the, the most important. That would mean that when you're giving, the previous, the fr previous verse, when you're practicing the perfection of generosity, you always want to meditate on the emptiness of the three spheres of that generosity. So in the case of generosity, when we talk about the debtor, meditating on the emptiness of the three spheres of dedication, remember before we talk about the, the merits, the goal dedicated to, and the, the dedication that complete, that uh, connects them, you know, this, may these merits bring this goal, that, that thought, that, that dedication, each of those elements are empty of inherent existence. In the case of generosity, maybe a little bit, can be a little bit similar, but a little bit different. You think of the, I myself, the giver, the recipient, and the act of giving that bring, you know, that take, that brings the, the gift to the recipient, or there are other ways of dividing it up also. Those three are empty of inherent existence. So when you're giving, you're not, you're not developing the pride, I'm giving. There's no I, inherently existent I, the way that the mind thinks who's giving. There's no inherently existent recipient, just imputedly existent other. And there's no action of giving, which can be divided up, up into the, you know, the gift and so forth. All of these are just imputedly existent. One would, if, when, when you are spending time on this verse, go to some of the texts, go to the teachings on the perfection of generosity. Uh, there are certain things that you, you, uh, you should give, certain, certain things you should not give. You shouldn't give, for instance, in general, you shouldn't give uh, weapons to those who might use them to harm others. You shouldn't give alcohol to uh, someone who has a problem with alcohol, who is an addict, who is, a, who is an alcoholic. You shouldn't give drugs to those who are addicted and so forth. Various kinds of precepts. So those are things you can embellish these verses with when you meditate, but this is just talking about uh, the general outline of it when it's talking about uh, imagining transforming your body, your possessions, and your three-time merits into, with, with the oral instruction of how to en enhance your, your mind of giving, uh, transforming those things into whatever is desired by all sentient beings through that kind of practice uh, to perfect the, 
to complete the perfection of genera generosity. And then in the, ver in the verse of morality, so many different things to, to for instance, to when, when the Bodhisattva is on the second Bhumi and they have a special practice of the perfection of Shila, they don't break any of their vows, even in their dreams. Maybe you students are so good. Maybe that's not, maybe that's not surprising. Uh, to some of you, maybe some of you are actual bodhisattvas and higher bodhisattvas. Uh, sometimes in our dreams, we might do, we might imagine stealing or saying harsh words or hitting or acting out our acts, uh, our desires or sexual or sensual desires, breaking our vows in our dreams. Sometimes people wonder if you kill someone in your dream, do you break your vows? The, the bodhisattvas don't even break their vows even in their dreams uh, when they reach the second bhumi. That might be a, uh, if you can have lucid dreams, if you can be aware of your dreams, uh, that might be something that you might be able to try to practice to observe your vows, even in your dreams. The, the way that you would collect virtuous dharmas in your dreams, as Lama Sopa and other Lamas have said, is, for instance, imagine in your dream a pure land and emanating many bodies into those pure lands, all of them prostrating at the same time, making offerings at the same time, chanting the praises of the Buddhas at the same time, collecting virtuous karma, collecting virtuous dharmas this way, and benefiting sentient beings, sending out uh, emanations that teach the Dharma to sentient beings, the giving of the Dharma and so forth. Benefiting sentient beings that way. So Sutim Parchin Sukpa Jengilo. So let me just introduce the next verse because we, as you notice, we, we go over the verses again and again in a slightly abbreviated and sometimes different points. Kamsun kegu malu jokyurte, sheshing sangju dikshing sokcho kyam, nituk nolen pempa jukchepe, sopar barchin sopar jingiro. So this is talking about the perfection of patience, sopa. Like Lama Sopa, Rinpoche Sopa. Geshe Sopa, I think I've mentioned it before, Geshe Sopa spelled his name. When you, tr you try to write in, in uh, what do you call Roman letters, we say Z or S Sopa. Geshe Sopa used to write his name with an S. It's the same Tibetan word, Sopa, that means patience. Shanti. Kashanti. So, Kamsum means the three realms. Kegu is a funny word. In the in Mutra Dharma Bhadra's text, he has a different spelling of Kegu. The gu, K means, uh, you can say, rebirth, like, like boar, beings. Gu are spelled two different ways. One of the meanings of Gu is nine. And the other meaning is just all. So you can say all, all beings or the nine, nine births. So in the etymology of that, still means all beings. It means there are nine kinds of births. You can have be, you can be in the desire realm and take birth in the, from there you, you die and you transfer to, again to the desire realm. From the desire realm, you can take rebirth into the form realm. From the desire realm, you die and take rebirth in the formless realm. So there's three kinds of births that way, right? People that die from the desire realm, again, born in the desire realm, born in the form realm, born in the formless realm. People in the form realm die, born in the desire realm, again, born in the form realm, or born in the formless realm, three more. People dying, 
and transferring from the formalist realm to the desire realm, from the formalist realm to the form realm, from the formalist realm, again born in the formalist realm. Nine, so sometimes kegu means nine rebirths. It also just means the, another, the other spelling of gu is uh, with a, those of you know who Tibetan language, rapta, uh, 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 the letter R at the top, and the G underneath the, the uh, ragapta ga shabju gu. So that just means all. So all the beings of the three realms, the form realm, I say the desire realm, the form realm, the formless realm, or you can sometimes kam, kamsum can mean those that are born below the earth, like spirits, animals, and worms, and things, on the earth and above the earth, the like God realm and so forth, birds, and God realm. Anyway, kamsum usually means the three realms of desire, form, and formless. All of the beings, even if the, all of the beings, without exception, malu, were to get angry with me, trogyur, become angry. Does that ever happen to you? When your uh, people get angry with you for something, something you did, something you, you didn't, they just think you did, but still they get angry with you. Sheishing. Here, Muthu Dharma Bhadra's commentary says, uh, To, critic, to, to criticize or abuse unjustly. That means, ngosu rangla kyon mekyang. That means even though one is, was actually without fault, shengi nyondur, nondor zukpe sheba. That is abuse. So it's, it's not just regular criticism. It's mean you're criticized unjustly. If Sentient beings were to get angry with you, criticize you unjustly. Sheshing, Sangju Dikshing. Sangju, Sangju is an interesting word, means to dig up your hidden faults. That means to expose those things that you have, you don't want others to know your, your own defects. You know, you, you know, you, maybe you stutter or you, uh, or you have some kind of bad habits. You don't want people to know you smoke or they, you, know, you do some other naughty things or something. So some people exposing them, even if people were to get angry with you, criticize you, I mean, it's especially unjustly, uh, expose your hidden faults, the things that you want to keep hidden. You know, when we talk about the mental factors, One is if you've done negative actions and you hide them, that is, you don't ex you don't let other people know that you've done those. That's that's something that you want to avoid when you've created negative actions. Otherwise, you can't purify them. Kamsum kegu magu malu drogirte. Even if all the beings of the three realms, without exception, were to get angry with me, criticize me unjustly, dig you know expose my hidden faults. Dick means like. To threaten, you know, like you know, point your fingers. Yeah, you know, uh, we're gonna really mess you over, you know, or or uh, we're gonna kick you out of the club or something like this, kick you out of ABC or something. Or Xing, and even if they were to Sokcho to to take our life, to kill us. So even if all the beings of the three realms, without exception, here's the English translation, were to become angry at me, humiliate, hmm, sheshing, I'm not sure. It means to abuse, to abuse us unjustly, to criticize, it's not really, it, it means to expose your hidden faults, is that criticism? Threaten, that's okay for Dick, and even kill me. I seek your blessings not to be agitated. Me took. Wow, can you imagine if all of these, any of these things were to happen to keep your mind without becoming agitated? That's the 
that's the essence of patience, not to become agitated. Mituk non len penpe drupchepe. No means harm, len means to respond to that harm, penpa. Penpa drup means to, to, to bring about benefit in response to harm. So not just keeping your mind peaceful when all these things are people criticizing you or uh, uh, you know, getting angry with you, uh, criticizing you, digging up your, you know, exposing your hidden faults, threatening you, even taking your life, like the Buddha when he was a Bodhisattva in the Jataka tales, even having his ears cut off, his nose cut off, his body parts cut off, mind completely unagitated. And in response to their harm, benefiting them. That's the, it says, through those things, grant me blessings to complete the perfection of patience forbearance. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you keep that calmness? How do you develop that kind of patience? One of the special, the special sauce, right? To bring that about, the special method is the wisdom of emptiness and the practice, you know, of bodhicitta, the two bodhicittas. So recognizing that all of these things uh, are empty of inherent existence, even with, a, even with a conventional wisdom of impermanence, recognizing that this body has to be given, uh, given up, that all of these things that you're experiencing, the anger of others or their criticism of you, exposing your faults, threatening and killing you. All of this is a result of your past negative karma. All of these methods help you to develop that tranquility, mituk, not to be at, you know, to, to remain tranquil without being agitated. But here, particular to the patience of not responding with harm. This is talking about one of the particular kinds of patience when we talked about in the, in the eight verses of training the mind also, when we talk about several of the verses of talking about patients. So we'll talk more about this last time and next time. I seek your blessings not to be agitated, but to, but to return, to work for the benefits of, for their benefit in response to their harm. So I mentioned before uh, Geshe Rupton, when he was at Sarah, if he heard that some of the other students were criticizing him behind his back, which is said to be one of the, uh, the ways that you can purify a lot of karma very easily. When people criticize you, not to your face, behind your back, or you hear about it, you know, they're criticizing you. Uh, in response to that, rather than getting angry with them or planning some revenge, he would invite them over for momos. You know what momos are, right? The, I don't know what it's called in Chinese, Chinese dumplings, you know, meat dumplings at, at Sarah. He would invite them over, not with a kind of uh, snarky attitude like, oh, here, thanks so much. You didn't have to say that he knew that they were criticizing him, but just returning benefit to them, even though they've harmed him, criticized him, you know, and so forth. So the Buddha, in so many ways, when he was a Bodhisattva in the Jataka tales, uh, when people uh, harmed him in some way, you know, threatened him, put him in prison, uh, threatened his life, took his life, and so forth, he would use that opportunity in, in pr either praying or in actuality to, to bring about benefit for those beings. When the, when the 
bodhisattva, the Buddha was a bodhisattva practicing uh, patience and practicing generosity when he was a, a, a prince and uh, he was giving away all of the things of the kingdom and some of the people who came to ask for something were cannibals, you know the story. The ministers didn't want the Bodhisattva to see them because he, the ministers had an idea of what the cannibals would ask for. He wanted their, they wanted his life. So uh, he gave them, he said, yes, I, I will give you my, my life, uh, but you just have to uh, promise that in the future you will not you will not eat meat on full moons and new moon days and so forth. And so, in other words, he gave them, he returned their harm. This, this is overlapping, giving and patience and so forth, several perfections being practiced here. He actually benefited them, even though they wanted his, his life and so forth. So we'll, we'll continue from there next time. This, I think this is the, was this the eighth? Uh, the eighth class today. So we have four more. We've extended for four more weeks. Um, so we'll continue next time. Are there any questions? If anyone has some questions, we can, we have a couple minutes more to try to answer them. Hi, uh, please use the raise hand function. Do you have any questions? Okay, Violet, uh, you may unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Well, good evening to you. Uh, Hi, like to, I just like to know that the, there's one time of the lesson you mentioned about the five decisions for the Bodhicitta. Have you covered the last one already during the past few uh, lessons? Uh, I didn't catch what you said. The five what? What is it? Five decisions of the Bodhicitta. Oh, five decisions. Yes. I mentioned uh, this teaching that, uh, let's see if I have it up here, uh, of the verses that we've gone over, I don't think I have it up here. Uh, this is the, the, the teaching that uh, Sarko and Sancha Bravishay gave uh, on the verses of uh, that we've already covered up up to the verse on Dana Jesu Lama Tuk Chen. There are five verses, and in the sequence of generating uh, and meditating on those verses, I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring I'll bring that uh, that teaching next time. I, I would have to dig on my computer right now to find it, and I don't have it at the tip of my, my fingers here. So, um, well, like for instance, the, the, the verse that I mentioned today, the verse about um, being a, to grant me blessing to be able to equalize and exchange myself and others. Uh, Sirkan Rinpoche mentioned that, that that was the decision was I to make the, you know to make the decision I am capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do something, you have to have a, a sense of capability. Mm -hmm. I can do this. This is something that's that's doable. If it's mm -hmm. if it's not doable, mm -hmm. you know you you'll have no energy to actually try it. Right? If you don't yes. have confidence. So that, that verse was, the decision of that one was to, uh, to decide, I am capable of doing this because the Buddhas uh, of the past started like ourselves, even lower than ourselves now. They were flies at one time and, and uh, they worked successively to be able to develop these states of mind. I don't remember the other ones off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll try to have them for you next time, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Someone else have a question? Everyone knows?
Okay, no, if no questions, let's do, let's do a short dedication. Again, remember that when, whenever one practices the, the practice of dedication, dedication, conventional dedication means recognizing that you've created some virtuous karma, either through the action that you've done now or all of the virtuous karma that you have created in the past. You have a goal that you're going to dedicate those merits, sort of trying to, to pray that these merits will ripen in this goal or these goals. So that you have two things, the merits, the goal, and the act of dedication was due to these merits, recognizing the causality, when they ripen, may they ripen in these ways. Just hit my computer here. That's called conventional, uh, conventional dedication. Once you've done that, that can prevent the, the merits from dissipating until that point, you know, exhausting. They'll, they'll continue until that point. There'll still be some residue left, but they can still be destroyed by anger, by wrong view, and other states of mind, abandoning the Dharma and so forth. So the way to protect them from that is to seal the conventional dedication in the emptiness of the three spheres. The merits that you've created, like say tonight, with a, with a good motivation, you waited to enter into class for the benefit of sentient beings. Those merits that we've created this evening are empty of inherent existence. Although your mind might imagine, oh, I had a good, a good state of mind. My mind was virtuous. I had an experience of, of uh, wanting to give or, or wanting to eliminate the suffering of others. That is, those virtues that we've created, that we, we imagine that we've created, don't exist inherently. They exist nominally. That is, merely imputed. You can't, you can't find them anywhere. Even the, even the actual, like you say, giving, I gave. And you're going to dedicate those merits. So you might imagine, oh, I gave. It's quite apparent. I had this money and I gave it to the beggar. That act of giving from the point of view of emptiness, from the... the uh, if you were to investigate, does that giving, where does that giving exist? Is it exist halfway, three quarters of the way? Giving is just a name imputed to that activity. It doesn't have an inherent existence from its own side. It's not truly existent. So meditating on the merits as empty of inherent existence, meditating on the goals dedicated to, such as your successive elevation of mind from life to life, developing better, higher and higher qualities from life to life, up into and including enlightenment. So all of those stages, all of that also is just merely imputed by the mind, is, is, is mere nominally imputed. Even the state of Buddhahood, you might say, if Buddha were to appear before you, oh, that really exists. No, that's just, that, that is only imputedly existed also. Even Buddhahood, even emptiness is imputedly existent. There's nothing that is inherently existent, existing from its own side, without the need to impute by the mind. And the act of dedication, Joining these merits with those goals, I mean, in some ways, that's more easy to see how that is merely imputed. You know, where does the dedication exist? You're imagining the the causality, the the ripening of these 
karmic seeds that I've created, may they result in these goals that I'm dedicating to. That is just a mental activity. It can't be found on any of the moments or elements of that activity. It's merely imputed. So let's do that. Imagine that this evening we've created virtuous karma, pa patiently listening to this American boy talking with a good heart. We've created some virtuous karma. We've created virtuous karma in the past, in our, in our life and in past lives that still exists in our mind stream. All of these virtuous seeds together dedicate, even if they've been dedicated before, rededicating them to the achievement of spiritual goals, this life, future lives, all the way up to enlightenment. In whatever way these actions ripen, the karmic seeds that I've left on my mind stream, may they not simply be exhausted in some temporary happiness in the future that brings no spiritual gain, but in whatever way they ripen, may they always increase the two bodhicittas in my mind stream up to and including my achievement of enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Making a heartfelt dedication. And then sealing those, sealing that conventional dedication in the emptiness of the three spheres. The karmic seeds I've created are empty of inherent existence. You can think of the actions themselves that create the seeds. Can't be found anywhere on that, you know, at what, at what point was generosity actually achieved? It's like walking. There's no inherent coming and going. There's no, no place that the, the coming or going actually takes place. It's merely imputed. The goal dedicated to, the goals, in this case, successive goals of, an, of developing the two bodhicittas from life to life up to and including enlightenment. All of that is from the viewpoint of a mind that's equipoised on the highest ultimate truth and emptiness. None of them exist inherently. They appear to the mind. And in appearing to the ordinary mind, they, they appear to be inherently existent, but they are actually devoid of that inherent existence that's findable. It's not findable in any of the parts. It's not findable separate from the parts. It's just a name given to that appearance. And the act of dedication appears to the mind, but can't be found on any of its elements. It's empty of inherent existence. So in that way, when we dedicate, you know, the, the verses that we usually say, Gewa di nyurdu dag, lama sange drubdirne, so forth and so on. You know, due to these merits, may I quickly become a guru Buddha, 
uh, and lead every sentient being into that very same state. So that's due to these merits, may this, this goal be achieved, you know, lead all sentient beings into that very same state. That usually doesn't include the meditation on the emptiness of the three spheres. So you can enhance those dedications with that knowledge. So unless there's a question, is there any last question before we sign off? No? Okay. Hope to see you again next week, okay? Take care. Bye.